Hello, hello, hello there. Welcome back to another Let's Harp About It family. My name is Winnie O. And if you're new to Let's Harp About It, uh, pull up your chairs and get comfortable because today we got an exciting, exciting discussion on consent culture. And my guest today will be Stacey Pierbond. She'll be here shortly, so don't worry, she'll be right in. But as you know, the focus here on HARP, which is a harassment and assault reporting platform, as well as on Let's HARP About It, is always on increasing education and awareness of harassment and assault incidents, whether, again, whether it's those incident trends or highlighting prevention methods, you know, we want to make sure that we are empowering and equipping not only um, witnesses, but also experiences of these incidents, as well as survivors, right? Helping, helping, helping you help us move from victimhood to survivorship. And so, um, but we, but we get into the meat and potatoes of today's discussion, um, high level, you know, um, if you haven't connected with us yet, uh, please do so. If you're picking up what we're putting down on here on Let's Harp About It and across the Harp platform, do connect at www.harpnow.org or on social media platforms at harpnow.org. That's H-A-R-P-N-O-W-O-R-G. So let's get right into today's topic. When, when we think of consent, right, people often, you know, assume that consent automatically means sexual scenario related incidents or sexual consent. But that's not true because we can absolutely teach consent at every age, you know, and at the end of the day, we just have to make it contextual, contextually applicable to that individual, right? And, or, or that group. So even when we're talking consent education by age group, you know, making sure that it's age appropriate, right? Because the way a toddler understands consent is very different than the way a preteen or a teenager or a young adult understands consent. And so, you know, at the core of it, you know, consent um, is both a noun and a verb, yes. Um, and it simply, you know, implies the giving of permission for something to happen or an agreement to do something, right? So you're saying, yes, I allow for this thing to happen or no, I'm not vibing with that. I do not want it to happen. And so, you know, also I would like for us to understand also in the global context, right? Consent, consent could be perceived differently, you know, across the globe and even how people under, come to understand, you know, the cultural norm of consent, because that's, that's what it is. Consent culture, right? Um, it may vary depending where you are across the globe in season and time. And as we've seen as some cases have come to light um, both in, you know, in the media as well as in the judiciary system, you know, how consent and the idea of consent has morphed and changed over the years um, as more people have become aware of consent and bodily autonomy, right? Understanding the importance of enthusiastic consent, of informed consent, of implicit and explicit consent, right? Where, you know, we really, uh, by now people are understanding that like, listen, if it's a maybe, eh, proceed with caution you know, don't do it. Like, make sure you are getting enthusiastic consent, you know? And I'm talking across the board, whether, again, from the boudoir to the boardroom, right? To the streets, you know? And law enforcement too. Yes, consent matters across all areas of our lives. And a quick tag from a blog post that, you know, we did earlier uh, last year, it was this global context of understanding how even, you know, quick example, how Kenya's um, underage pregnancy saw a spike during COVID, right? And, and it kind of, it brought this fresh um, kind of highlight onto the reproductive health bill that was under review at that time, going through the parliament. And as I reviewed it, I found something very problematic about it, where when I, when, when I reviewed it, I saw it was heavily focused on abstinence and religious reliance on religion and and mentoring to avoid pregnancy, avoid you know unwanted pregnancies, both underage and otherwise, right? And also, I saw this you know heavy um, language that res restricted you know clear access to um, contraceptive health, right, or even just information on contraceptive health excuse me, oh, pardon, or even just contraception itself, you know? Um, 
And it really took the power away from the individual who may experience these um, incidents of, of unwanted pregnancy and they, they would want to make that decision for themselves. So, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, I would really champion for better policy making as well when it comes to how we allow people to exercise consent and bodily autonomy, right? At every age, right? From uh, toddlers to grown adults. And so, you know, just for a quick example, you know, California's definition of consent defines consent as a person's positive cooperation in act or attitude in accordance with an act of free will. The person giving his or her consent must act freely and voluntarily, as well as understand the nature of the transaction or act to which he or she is consenting to. Okay. And so over the last you know, couple of years, uh, we've seen you know, about 38 states um, and the District of Columbia um, enact new laws on sex education, um, particularly strengthening requirements for the inclusion of LGBTQ plus students and instruction on dating, as well as sexual violence prevention, and overall just you know, educating folks to have healthy relationships, because that's what it really comes down to, understanding that we are you know, allowed to, you know, prioritize having healthy relationships with or without sexual, you know, components of it, right? We are, we are allowed to prioritize and to want and express that we want healthy relationships across the board. And so speaking of healthy relationships and consent and bodily autonomy and all that good stuff, I would like to invite Miss Stacy Pierbond. Come on through, sister girl. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> I've been so excited about this because like this has been planned for months. Mm -hmm. And so like every week I'm like, hey girl. <laughs> I'm like, I can't wait. Like I see her post. Also, if you don't, if you're not following her yet, she's on IG, mm -hmm. Facebook as well, I believe. So yeah. her stuff is like not only informative, but entertaining as well, because I think that it's so important to do that. Mm -hmm. And so before before I get too far ahead of myself here, for those who are unfamiliar with you and your work. Please introduce yourself. Yay, thank you so much, Winnie. So um, as I mentioned, my name is Stacey. My, um, you can find me at, at Parabon Co uh, on IG and YouTube and Facebook, I believe. Yes, Facebook. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Um, you know, I've worked in higher education for the last 12 years, but I am also a sex educator slash sexologist by like trade side work. Um, and so, you know, for me, I found this work so interesting because I grew up in this little bubble, right? I knew nothing about anything. Um, you know, my my mom is an immigrant from a really Catholic country. So I went to Catholic school my whole life, learned nothing, knew nothing, feared everything, right? And so I don't know, but you know, across my lifespan, I always had these interactions, curiosities, and just things that had happened where I was like, huh, what about this? But there was no resources, no way to learn things. And I was just really uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, for those of us that identify as women or are treated as women or feminine, you know, you get sexualized across your lifespan, right? So I remember being like 11 or 12. And this man, you know, I was walking to my friend's house, you know, pulled up and he said, leaned over and said, hey, can my nephew get your number? And I was like, what? This kid looked like he was eight. And I was like 11 or 12. So I was like, too cool. Um, and I was like, no. And he said, can I? Ew. So, no. Ew, exactly. So it was kind of moments like that that kind of shaped my perspective on a lot of these things. I then went to college and I went to school in Philadelphia and just had this exposure to everything. It's just like everything opened up and I was like, whoa, hold on a second. People are taught about this stuff and they learn about it and they're allowed to be okay with it. And it was just life changing. And so, you know, when I was in grad school, I worked in health education. I did a lot of um, sexuality education work, programming. My first job out of grad school was as a health educator. And I focused a lot on sexual violence and bodily autonomy and consent. And so that's where I've stayed ever since then. And that's really where I focus all of my efforts. But like you mentioned, I try to make everything fun because that's just reflective of who I am. Like I 
like to be entertaining, right? I can't help it. I think I'm an oldest child. I feel this need to make everybody like laugh and feel comfortable, but understand. And what I found is that I have this ability to take things that are like these big things that people are like controversial, confusing, and just break them down into these little pieces that you can, okay, I can take this piece and I can understand that and I'm okay with it. And it just moves the needle every day until we get to this place where things like sexual violence and having people who experience different kinds of trauma related to their sexuality across their lifespan becomes something that's not normalized, right? And so that's really my goal is to take, when you look at the statistics for people that experience sexual violence, it's astounding, it's shocking, it's stunning. I want that to go away. It seems like a lofty miss mission, but oh well, I'm here for it. And so are you. <laughs> right? It meant to that. Like, right? And that's the thing. I, and I hear that so often. They're like, Winnie, like, you know, like the goal seems so ginormous, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's we're we're simply, you know, two people or the many of us who are out here doing this work who we see the problem. And we are moved enough and passionate enough to say, I recognize how significant it is. And all I can do is my part. Exactly. So whatever my skill set, my technicality, my passion, the fervor in which I bring my life force to it, I will do that part. Yeah. Exactly. You know? And that's all we're responsible for. Yeah. That's it, you know? <laughs> well, my, no, go ahead. No, no, love, go ahead. <laughs> so my goal is to make consent the norm for everything that we do all day. And so you think about something like in the US, right, with smoking. Yes. Mm -hmm. You could smoke at work, in buildings, while you're pregnant, all these other things. Like, it's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Look at where we are now, where we have whole areas that are smoke free. Most people don't smoke anymore, like it's, it's cigarettes. And so it's it's we've changed the narrative around that. If yes. you can do it with something like that, you can change it with something like consent. We can change our understanding of it and how we incorporate it where before everyone smoked. Yes. And now not as many people do, are engaging in those behaviors. And so right. we can do that same thing, but there's layers of things that we need to like approach, attack, make comfortable and yes. just make so so fun. So like consent is one of them and peeling back those layers of like, what does consent mean? How do I use it? Is it something that's unapproachable? Is it boring? Does it ruin my sex? No. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, first of all, anyone who says consent ruins the mood, you're not doing it right. Because if you're doing it right, it's actually supposed to enhance the mood. Yeah. It can okay. increase your desire, increase your arousal, like all of these things, because there's this anticipation now that's building as opposed to fear and uncertainty yes. and unknown. Yes. And that's that's what happens with a lot of, um, you know, sexual. That's how we're taught to interact with our sexual yes. partners is that like it's like a surprise party. And you're like, nah, I, there's it's not like you're following a script or yeah. you know, anything like that but there are generally you know everyone's body is different right so yes. you understand how does my body work how does my body respond to touch where am i comfortable being touched where do i like mm. to be touched? Yes. and so a lot of times with the consent work that i do is to try and impress upon people to like be comfortable with yourself right yep. start part. there because when you really look at how we've been taught with society right so for me to develop as a sexual being Right. I have my own internal sense of what that means yes. and start there. But then I have my family, right, that tells me and teaches me or models certain things. And so then right. I learn, OK, so these things that I think or feel, hmm, it doesn't match. So then you change. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's this dissonance that occurs. But then you see, OK, well, I see these things on TV and this yep. is also different. So then how do I make sense of that versus what my family says and then what I'm feeling? OK. Mm -hmm. And then you see what your friends are doing. And you're like, okay, some of that matches, some of it doesn't. And so along the way, it changes how you interact with the world and how your sexuality is expressed. And it becomes uncomfortable because you are doing or saying things that are like not true to yourself. Mm. And so you're not really able to understand your sexuality. And we limit people so often regardless of gender and part of what that does is that it discourages consent because there are some people who are taught that consent is not part of their sexual experience yeah. right so some people are taught i don't need to get it i don't need to ask it there's an expectation that mm. something for me 
period. Like I can have it whenever I want it. It's not something that I have to interact with. And then the flip side of that is that you have this group of people who then feel like I don't have the autonomy or the agency to have control over that experience. And so you have all of these layers, right? These things that you've learned along your lifespan where you're like, this is telling me how I'm supposed to be. Yes. When the reality is, is that it doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work. Period. The end. So explore your sexuality. Find out what you like. Find out what you don't like. And tell right. people about it. Like scream it from the rooftops because you know, it's unfortunate that sexual violence is part of our society. And in a lot of ways, it's it's systemic and it's systematic, right? And it's built oh. into the fabric. Go but, into that. Go into that. Right? But, the, the, under, the understanding of the systemic as well as systematic approach to systemic, sexual violence. So when it the, the systems, right? So part of it is mm -hmm. that there are systems that we've designed that are created that promote, right? Yes. Sexual violence, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's everything from what we're taught in schools, how people are modeled to be male and female, yes. um, the way that our criminal justice system is set up, the way that people talk to survivors, yes. uh, the lack of empathy that we have around that topic, um, that people don't understand how to use empathy, right? So there are all these systems, <laughs> even when you look at um, schools, medical, like doctors and stuff and all, all that, you can see that the way that they interact is not from a trauma informed, empathetic, yeah. um, sex positive space, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then the other thing is, is that we like, so there are factors that promote sexual violence, right? And so mm -hmm. anytime you promote sexual submissiveness by one gender, typically it's for people that are identified as female or that you have norms that support superiority and yeah. sexual entitlement, those are the kinds of things that then promote sexual violence. <laughs> mm, and we, that part. Yes, and we definitely have that and you definitely see it. So then when you have things like that happening, um, you have sexual violence that occurs, right? And so mm. those are all part of the layers because, you know, okay, as, a, as someone who identifies as female and who is identified as female, yes, I have to be sexually submissive to my partner, is, mm. that, is that is that is that how this works? No, no, <laughs> uh, the answer is no. And so part of that is you know people have bad experiences. So this isn't. I want to be clear, right? So there are people who take. There are those people who are perpetrators and who who commit sexual violence. Correct. They take away that person's ability to make decisions. Right. Yes. And so you have this this pot here. Everybody else, you need to get your stuff together and use consent, use your agency and just embrace all of those things because it makes it more clear when it doesn't happen. Like the more you understand what consent looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like, that when mm. it doesn't happen, there's no doubt. Right. Because yes. anytime there's like a court case, right, about, you know, consent or like a sexual violence, wherever people are like, oh, but what about this or what about this? You're putting your own stuff on something that's pretty like black and white, in my opinion. <laughs> Oh, like, yo, the what about isms of it all, like, fam, yes. like, that is ridiculous to yeah. me. The way we will, no, the way society will excuse, you know, abusive or toxic or unwelcome behavior mm -hmm. in the name of, but that's normal, right? Oh, you know, he continued touching you or he, or he continued to, to coerce you. And that's like, again, we, we both have like posted this several times, the fact that coercion does not equate consent. Mm -hmm. Just because you can get somebody from no to a maybe in the hopes of getting to a yes, that yes is not truly consensual mm -hmm. at that point. That is not informed consent. That no. is not enthusiastic consent. No. That is not, you know, any kind of consent. That is coercion. And therefore, Correct. we need to be very clear. And again, when we talk about young folks, when we talk, even as adults, fam, like, oh, P.S., mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to be doing a, a series of things, especially for my ladies and gentlemen as well, things we wish we knew then that we know now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just a tip is an example of coercion. Yes. No. <laughs> or, you know, so one of the things that Winnie and I bonded over, I have this, mm, let's say story that I wrote, it's an adult children's book, and it, it's uh, quite ridiculous, but um, 
<laughs> but it's all about coercion, right? And just these ideas that we learn and we absorb. But at some point, you internalize that st stuff and you think that that's how I'm supposed to behave. And that when you don't, you feel like you're doing something wrong, even though what like what we say the laws are and then what we expect people to do are totally different, right? Mm. And it's the, the justice system supports the societal norms, not what the criminal code says. Yes. Yes. That's and, and you're right. Like we and we've seen time and time again where it really gets to the point where folks are then beginning to like like split hairs in in, in defining well what well what exactly is consent? Like how then do we have we really defined what consent is, you know? Um yes. And it's it's yeah. easy. Here we you, we all learn this from a very young age, right? You you learn about sharing, you learn about asking, you learn you're not supposed to touch other people's stuff. And at some point along the way, some people mm -hmm. are taught that those rules don't apply to them. Right? Ooh, 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 that yo, is that's crazy because yeah. I literally just had a conversation with a dear person of mine. I'm not gonna mention her, but you know, it's, people again. People people assume that it's only only in like sexual relations, but the reality is literally anytime, anytime you allow somebody in your space, mm -hmm. whether that's physically, emotionally, you know, mentally, anytime you allow somebody in your space, and they feel like their autonomy or their boundaries have been crossed or have the potential to be crossed, and they and they and they tell you, hey, this thing that you're doing, I'm not for it you ought to be mindful of them like okay you know yes they have clearly stated that's a boundary you know i'm not gonna then try to impose my perception of what is okay or not they've right. already told you i do not consent to this behavior right and I, mind you this this scenario that i'm talking about has nothing to do with sex exactly and usually you it does, and a lot of it starts when you're younger. So I'll give Thank you an example. You. My my cousin, he's quite a bit younger. There's like a 20 year age gap between us. And so, you know, he I just watched babysitting, watching him, and he I think he wanted me to go outside. It was like 100 degrees out, and I was like, no, I'm not going outside. You're right. And he's uh -huh. like, but why? But why not? Can't you just go outside with me? And I looked at him and I said, listen. If someone tells you no, you have to accept yeah. that. I understand that you want something different, but if you ask yeah. someone to do something with you and they say no, that's it. You can't continue yeah, to ask, right? you can't beg, you can't do all this like moaning and groaning stuff. It's mm -hmm. just no. And I don't yeah. have to tell you why. I will tell mm. you it's too hot for me right now, if you must mm. know. <laughs> but it's, it's just that I'm allowed to set the boundary and I don't need to feel like I have to explain it. Right now, if someone's trying to understand where they made a mistake, right? Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's fine. I want to know that you want to understand why I've set this boundary. It's because you want to do better. That's fine. Exactly. And I'll that's where you come from. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. What, yeah. what do you want to know? <laughs> no, I, yo, fan. That is so true. Because you're right. Because too often, especially when it comes to situations where you blatantly, where a person has blatantly crossed a line. Mm -hmm. And the per and, and and then the person who is being victimized or feels like oh uh, you know uh, uh, the discomfort of it all really yeah. then when they express hey you know it, it takes a lot of energy for somebody to even like hey listen you're crossing a boundary of mine mm -hmm. and because I, I and I can speak especially as a woman mm -hmm. as a black woman mm -hmm. as a black woman in STEM you know navigating the society like it is very difficult for a lot of us, you know, and, and I'm, I'm talking again, I'm talking not just about in, in the sexual scenarios, whether it's in the workplace, mm -hmm. right? If you're just navigating outside, if you're literally gr grocery shopping and somebody happens to cross your boundaries, it takes a lot of um, just intention and willpower to talk, first of all, to talk yourself through it, to talk yourself from, oh yeah, that's just in my head. Right. Because we can validate those very mm -hmm. real experiences. We invalidate ourselves and say, oh, "Okay, man, I, I'm making too big of a deal." I'm like, "No, fam. Like, if 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 it if it triggered something, you need to be able to step on, acknowledge mm -hmm. it, and be like, you know what? Currently, this thing is not working for me. Yeah. And then if you ask me to explain it, I might explain to you, or I might reiterate the fact that it just doesn't align with where I am right now. Right. You're not entitled to that explanation. You're just entitled to my answer. That's all. Period. 
And you know, it's interesting you bring that up. I was listening to a podcast a few months ago and mm -hmm. Leslie Odom Jr. who was in Hamilton, right? That's the only thing I really know him from. Um, but he had this really cool quote and he was kind of, he was talking about how, you know, the experiences that he has as a male actor in the industry and how they're different from folks that are identi are identified as female in the industry um, and how they don't they're not even given the option to have that agency to say mm -hmm. yes or no to things that they always feel like there's a pressure for them to be sexualized mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. he was talking about it in con in the context because he has a daughter and he's like it's just not something that I want her to have that experience mm -hmm. to feel like she can't even say no that she's yeah. not even given that opportunity to say no mm -hmm. um, and he's like that I mean the word he used he said that's colonialism it is though it is <laughs> It, it is. literally is like it like, is like <laughs> like uh, and that's the thing where people people don't realize and 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 again that's that's why we have these platforms that's why we are holding space for people to get comfortable yeah. exercising these scenarios of where you regain your bodily autonomy you gain the power of your no you regain the power of your yes it's important that we reclaim our spaces, mm -hmm. our mental health, because again, it ties back to like everything about this from health, from general physical health to mental health and well being, right? To our psychological like health. Like, this yeah. is so important. And to sit there and again, to highlight this issue that happens literally across many work workspaces, right? Where people mm -hmm. feel like they cannot challenge something because, oh, because like, there's usually a reason of it. They're like, I'm afraid I'll get retaliation one mm -hmm. way or another, right? I'm afraid this is act, like that it's going to either come back and impact me or impact somebody else around me that I care about. Because it's not mm -hmm. always coming about it coming back to them. It's there is usually some sort there there is there is a reaction that folks are usually trying to avoid. So they will they will complacently give into the coercion because let's call it what it is. It's coercion. It could be mm -hmm. implicit, it could be explicit, but at the end of the day, it's still coercion. Mm -hmm. which is therefore not consent. Consent is very different. Consent is an informed and a willful agreeance to a thing, mm -hmm. right? Whereas coercion yeah. is manipulative mm -hmm. and tactical Correct. to get a desired outcome that's against the person's free will. Let's Correct. get into it. Yes, a hundred, <laughs> yes, like 100%. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of times when I am, so I typically work with higher education organizations. Right. And so, you know, one of the things that we see is that they mm -hmm. will not be comfortable addressing the real problem, right? Oh. So some of the things you're saying is that, well, we have these ways that you can report. Well, why aren't people reporting, right? Peel mm. that, okay, what are those things? And you touched on that. Well, I'm afraid of retaliation. Okay, well, okay, so what's causing that? Like, what are the systems that we have play in place that cause that fear to be there, right? What are the yes. things when we look at a societal level that cause that because we want people to feel in you know in theory safe in their workspaces right we want them to feel like they can report things and that if there is someone who is engaging in problematic behaviors that they will not be retaliated against they won't have to yes. continue to deal with them like that there will be something that happens and yes. the reality is is that that's not there and so it's you not. break that trust with your employees with your students when that doesn't happen and so when yes. you look at something like title nine which is the federal law that protects um people that are part of the higher education system um, mm -hmm. from sex discrimination, which when you break it down is sexual harassment and then it's, you know, sexual assault, stalking, dating and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are reasons why people don't report, right? And it's because of some of those systematic yes. um, elements that are in place that prevent you from feeling like I can report this, yeah. right? And a lot of it is because, you know, when we were talking, you know, before we started is that a lot of the work goes into, okay, we're going to do this 30 minute online educational program um, about bias, about sex mm. discrimination, about whatever, right? And then we're going to check the box and we're going to say we're done. Same thing with yeah. the students. You say, I'm going to do this at orientation or your welcome week. And you're going to say, great, I, look, <laughs> look at this great thing I did. Mm -hmm. I just want to tell you, like, you're doing it wrong. And that's always my perspective. And I want to try and help people as much as they can to understand that it needs to be a long-term, continuous, repetitive experience, right? And we need to 
in addition to the educational components, really address what are those systematic parts that are preventing this experience or making the experience more re-traumatizing for victims, yes. right? Because, uh, you know, one of some of the big organizations that work with Title IX, like Know Your Nine, um, they talk about institutional betrayal, right? And it's this sense that I have invested in this place, right? And I've given all of these things to them and I need help, right? Something something in that that contract between myself and the institution has been broken. And it's the onus is on them to repair it, but they don't and they can't, and they're not willing to. And so now you have this institutional betrayal that's happened. And so how do you as a survivor or like a victim recover from that? You have to continue to go back to this place every day and now you're tied to it. Like you just think about the layers to it because, okay, I can't transfer because I lose my credit. Like there's a monetary um, pen penalty for you as a victim or survivor for doing something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Or you have mental health you know, strain that comes upon yeah. that. You're not able to recover from your trauma. You know, perhaps your perpetrator is still there and you're right. like not being able to heal. Like there's just, there's all these parts, you know, you try to go to class and you need extra time, you need extra support and the fact that you aren't willing to work with you, you need your housing moved, like you can't work because of the trauma and now you yes. can't feel, and it's just, it's all of these layers and we're supposed to have all of these systems in place to help this and we just do a bad job i'll say it. Mm. we do i mean some places do better than others but overall i we're just not willing to do the work that is required um i focus a lot of my um programming on programming itself right most of the work i do is around programming and teaching people yeah. here are the things we need to think about here are the things we have to do um and here are the things we should be doing, or here's the frameworks. Um, and I found that folks are uncomfortable. Like when I do Title IX presentations, <laughs> I talk about sex. And so sometimes people say, oh, you do a sex presentation. And I go, no, no, I'm doing a presentation about consent, right? The problem is, is that we don't have good sex positive, holistic, comprehensive sex education in this country. So by the time you're 18, if you're seeing me and this is the first time you've heard the things that I'm telling you, it's too late. That, ooh, ooh, family, literally. <laughs> like, be because by the, yeah, if you're if you're catching at eighteen, if, and if you're like me, who was super sheltered, you know, growing up in a very African, I mean, like we've seen we've seen those memes and videos and reels of like, hey, if if you're if you see me outside with my with my African parents, I do not know you boys do not exist. I, like I remember like when I, this one time, like we were coming back from church, like with our girlfriends, and and she's like, oh yeah, this boy. I was like, oh, mm -mm, we do not know what boys are. Are. Boys do not exist. Mm -hmm. the boys are not a part of our vocabulary. What are those? I don't know what those are. You know. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, right? he's like, "No boys, no boys, no boys." And then you graduate. Like, where's your husband? Where's your husband? <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly it. You go from nothing to everything, yes! and you just need these steps in between. And you need to be allowed to have the steps. And and having, you know. I think a lot for women, there's a lot of risk in doing that and taking that autonomy and having that agency over your sexuality because there's a lot of things that you risk losing yeah. by doing that, by being outspoken. You know, for people like yourself and me, the kind of work that we do, it makes us targets. <laughs> um, <Talk about. laughs> it's true. I mean, like the, some of the messages and DMs I get are very strange. Yes. <laughs> and we'll just kind of leave it at that. But it makes you a target because you're willing to speak out. And for some people, it makes them feel like you are offending them personally. And yes. you're really just trying to help people find equity yes. in the society that they live in. And that's it. It's not about you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, and that's the great that's the thing I've realized to me, like doing this advocacy work. It, 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 I find I, I find the parallels in it to even when I talk about like anti-racism, anti-bias, mm -hmm. right? Where when you begin to shift the power dynamics, right? Because that, that's what advocacy is. They're rooted in what? Advocate. 
to lend your voice to those in need, especially mm -hmm. typically it's in the context of judiciary processes. That was the root. And so when we begin to shift, because it's a power, mm -hmm. it's a power imbalance that we're addressing. When we begin to shift this power imbalance, those who have for so long been in the position of power, right? People mm -hmm. who are typically the oppressors, when the people who have been in the position of power, they're beginning to feel that deficit. They're like, hold up, because again, going back to physics, power is neither created nor destroyed, it's simply shifted, right? There's still gotta be a balance in things. I know, I'm always gonna tag the engineer in me. It's always gonna like reflect. And so when we're trying to shift this balance and bring back to a stability, like, okay, homeostasis, they're like, hold up, you're taking something from me somebody in position of power you're taking this thing from me that I've, I've enjoyed for so long and we're like but you have been denying it of me and i'm but, telling you i need i need to be seen right in similar light like can you also see me as human can you see me as deserving of my own body and my own safety as well of deserving of my own voice yes Right? Yes. And and what people don't realize is that when you can engage in sexual activity or sexual behavior with like consensual ways, your sex life gets so much better. Like right? you're just like doing it wrong. Right. It's kind of my two cents, because when you have an understanding of like, even if it's a partner that you're only going to see once, like the th things that they want, the things that they don't want, the way that their body likes to be touched, like when you just think about that, like you can run through some of these questions just like thinking about those answers can promote arousal and so ask them those questions what is your fantasy what are the things you like to do i like this how do you feel about it like you okay. have to make it like like creepy you don't need to i don't know you know like people perceive consent as this very robotic experience mm -hmm. but you know having your partner whisper in your ear like when you consented to have sex like would you like it if i and you're like oh right and like, and if you say yes or no, whatever answer, they're totally fine and they move on to the next thing. Or yes. if you offer them a suggestion and just say, hey, you know, how about this? Or this <laughs> work, you know, because our bodies are different. Like if you, even if you are, regardless of what gender you're engaging in, yes. life, right? Like everyone's body is different, right? Everyone's nerve endings are different. Everyone's sensitive. People have other traumas that they've experienced where they don't like certain things. Like yes. if you do this, it's it's going to be triggering. Like I can't, we yes. can't do. It. But and it could, yeah. What about this? Yo, and and that's a, like, and as I've spoken with like different people, it's interesting. Also, the things are that like, you would think are very innocuous or like, oh, that's a very simple thing. But for some people, it's like a big no no, mm -hmm. right? Something as like if you're touching them like somewhere on their body that seems like just banal, like common. Yeah. They're like, no, I really don't want you to touch me there. And like literally yeah. could be like a shoulder or like an elbow or a knee or like, it's 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 so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And you were like, oh my God, I wouldn't have thought of that. But I'm like, but you wouldn't know until you ask. And even yeah. like, right, and it's not just about putting the onus on the person who says, I like this, but it's also being able to say, I don't like this, right? right. It's Bring it, it's, it's oh, oh, taking back the power of like saying, hey, you know, before we engage in this, I'll, and, and again, like, because to me, like, I look at it more of like a sexual onboarding, <laughs> where it's like, hey, yeah. here's here's your quick, you know, to, you know, introduction. <laughs> I like X, Y, Z. I do not like X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, like, how do we make this work? What are you into? Yeah. You know? and like, and let's, again, let's, let's talk. <laughs> yeah, it's literally a conversation. Yeah. You know, I'm like, people, and then think, People talk about everything else except the essentials. People are willing, right. they will tell you everything else. Yes, 100%. Like you think about how much effort, like if you have a partner, like you put into eating together. Yes. Right? Like how, okay, what would you like to eat today? Yes. I don't know. What do you want to eat today? And like, you know, it just that whole back and forth or one person really wants something and they're like, <laughs> like I want pizza. How about that? And, you know, it's like, well, I don't really feel like pizza. Okay, well, if we order from here, why don't we eat? Like, we will spend hours and hours of our lives talking about what Ooh. we're going to eat. Right. <laughs> Apply that. And think, does it ruin the eating experience for you? No. Because guess right. what? I love food. Okay. Yeah. I'm very happy when that meal comes and it's what I want. Like, I am the happiest person. Don't talk to me. Yes. But oh. <laughs> food is my love. People, anybody who knows me knows that food is definitely one of my key love languages. Eh? I'm gonna put it out there. Food is my love language. Eh? And, so, <laughs> and so, like, even I look at it with like my friends whom 
I have these, you know, we ha- we go out together and, you know, when we go to eat somewhere, like my, like my friends, like really know like my particularity when it comes yeah. to food. And it, there's something about like when they're considerate of that, right? So like if we go out and I happen to be out of the table or something because they know me so well, you know, right. Like they'll be like, oh, I know she like like my my one girlfriend this one time, um, we were somewhere. I think we're actually in Atlantic City, and <laughs> and she was ordering. We were ordering food service, room service, and she literally like went down the list. Like I had I was like, oh, I want this. I want <laughs> like she at that season. I was crazy about ranch. She's like, oh, make sure there's ranch. Yeah, because I, I forgot about it. But she's like, Winnie, don't you want ranch? She's like, I was like, yes, yes, I want that. And then I was like, she's like, do you want ice cream? I was like, yeah, yeah, I want ice cream. And then she she remembered. She's like. Do you want? Uh, do you want? Because I think what it, I know, I wanted apple pie. It was apple pie, but as she knew I wanted it hot though. She's like, make sure it's hot. And then she's like, do you want ice cream? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I want ice cream too. But she's like, but make sure the ice cream is separate from the apple pie because she likes it. And I was like, and in my, and this was like year. This is probably over ten years ago. But like, it's moments like that that I'm like, it's stuck with me. But I'm like, wow, this like I just I'm like I knew she knew me, but I was like, you feel cared for. You feel supported. Yeah. And part of what makes a sexual experience positive is you, the ability to be vulnerable with another person. But what comes with vulnerability is the ability to feel safe, right? You need to feel oh. safe first in order to be vulnerable, right? And a, some of this is tied to just like how our brains work. So if you break down like the three different parts of our, our brains, right, you have the brainstorm, which controls your sex drive, right? Okay. But then what you have next is like all the stuff in like your, your limbic system and that controls your arousal, mm-hmm. okay? What's also located in that same section, though, is your stress response. Ooh. Okay. And so that's where things can get complicated because the bottom, you know, the, not the bottom, the front part, your neocortex is where you have, okay, you're thinking about sex and this is how I feel about sex. And so if your limbic system, if, if your arousal is tied to your stress response, you're not going to have a positive sexual experience and you're going to have to reprogram some of those parts in your brain because if you've experienced trauma or you have not had positive interactions with your sexuality across your lifespan, right? Like you've lived in an environment where you've taught that you have to be submissive, you don't have any agency, um, you know, then that stress response is tied to your arousal. And and so it doesn't matter that you're thinking about sex and you feel like you wanna have sex and your sex drive is like, yeah, let's do it. That middle part is totally blocking everything. And so until you get all of that figured out, your sexual experiences are not going to be as enjoyable as they could be or as pleasurable because it just like, if you can, if you think about your sexual experiences as being tied to consent and pleasure, home run every time, home run. Okay. And that's what you want. (laughs) Yo. First of all, I like the fact that you definitely made it. You 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 brought back the technical in, and I appreciate that. I love when people make the technical practical because that's really like if you haven't noticed, that is really what we do. It seems like we're just talking about like regular stuff, but what we're really doing is because we have the contextual understanding of the technical, and oftentimes that's why people get lost because we try to make it super technical that they mm-hmm. feel like, well, that doesn't apply to me. Mm-hmm. I don't know how I fit into that. But when we when we finally are able to bridge that information gap where you're able to make the technical practical for everyday people, then they realize, oh, I can make it applicable to my lived experience. Yeah. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying yeah. to make it relevant to your everyday experience. And I'm glad that you mentioned, oh, right. Uh, we, we talked about how uh, past experiences shape um, mm-hmm. how you receive pleasure or how you experience pleasure or displeasure in such an environment. Um, and I mean, I, I got to touch on this because again, I was, I was, all, we were both raised mm-hmm. in, a, in very strong religious environments. Um, you got, and, 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 and I've seen this even, um, I believe, uh, what are they? I forget their name right now, but like Kev, Kev on stage and his wife, um, they addressed how, especially for those raised in super religious environments, mm-hmm. It is very difficult to go 20, 30 years being told, you know, no sex, no sex, no sex, wait till you're married. And all of a sudden, boom, like you're married night, now you're supposed to perform and be ready and be like, okay, just uh floodgates are open. I'm like, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't, your stress response is overriding everything. And then what happens is that you continue to associate 
sex with stress yes. and it just activates it. And so you see that, you know, like sexual dysfunction in women can be more common. Yes. I will say, so here I have two, two opinions on that. Opinion number one is that part of it is because of the way we're raised to interact with sex and our sexuality. We're not allowed to explore. We're not taught that our sex is for our own pleasure. The other part of it is that some of the research, not all of it, I will say that, but a lot of the research and historically researchers in general have been male. And so they look at sexual dysfunction through the male gaze. And so what that means is, is that if, if, if this is not working the way I expect it to, then it is dysfunctional. But what you're really doing is literally comparing apples and oranges, right? So if you look at an orange and you're like, well, this skin isn't soft and I can't bite into it, right? Then clearly there's something wrong with it. But it's an orange. It has its own independent elements and attributes, etc. It's still a fruit. They're both fruit, but they're separate, right? So you need to be examining, you know, those kinds of sexual responses through their own lens, right? So there are some things, right, that apply regardless of what kind of um, genitals you have or whatever it is we're talking about, reproductive systems. But then there are some characteristics that are unique, Right. And then there's there are those that only apply to that individual. And until we really examine sexuality from that lens, we're not going to have a really holistic, positive experience or understanding of it. I like science. I'm a little bit of like a sex nerd. So I love it. No. <laughs> You're in good company here. You're in good company. And I love, again, because for me, I put to, I I a fan girl. <laughs> over my like seriously like because people like people fangirl over like artists and stuff like that which I sometimes do or, or like athletes or whatever no no but who I fangirl over like my stem people like my style people I'm like oh my god I really love like what like people's work mm -hmm. right whatever mm -hmm. that work is whatever that passion comes out I absolutely love people who are walking in that purpose and really like exude that. And I'm glad you touched on something very important, right? When we talk about consent and pleasure or displeasure and awareness, it's this key idea of you cannot just copy paste what you do with one person or with one person to the next person and assume that it automatically works. And then you get offended when they're like, when you're like, this is not doing anything for me. It's not doing anything, right? No, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> right. no, like oh like that is and you know it happens more than people know and funny thing speak like quick plug uh do please if you're if you sis sisters out there if you're still out here faking it please stop you're not yeah. doing anything you no know, favors you're not doing a save a favor and you're not doing him a favor or her or whoever they are you're yeah, not doing especially, especially not yourself and one thing i try to encourage people to do and i know it can be uncomfortable is to understand how your body works like yes. what are the things that you find enjoyable what are the things that you'd be willing to share with a partner because everything you fantasize about isn't necessarily something that you want to do right sometimes yes. there's just things like <laughs> that you want to think about and have for your own self and like mind your own business with it and then there are things that you want to share with your partner so like what are those things when you think about it? it's like yeah i want like i want this and i want to talk to them about it um and we have to just build this foundation where everyone feels comfortable talking about this stuff and part of it is that we don't have the education around it we don't understand mm -hmm. how it works. we we think a lot of so the way part of how i teach is i teach using the circles of sexuality which mm -hmm. comprises of five different components and then it's governed by your power and agency the part that we're typically taught is you know sexual reproductive pre yes. reproduction right but there are the other elements like their sexual behavior their sensuality there's intimacy right and so when you don't learn about those parts you really don't understand how does that interact with the other pieces because if i'm only learning about reproduction and you know preventing pregnancy and preventing stis how do you learn about those other parts which are just as important to your sexuality because that then impacts how much power and agency you feel like you have over your sexuality and how much power and agency someone else feels like they have over yours mm. so. come on now <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if you didn't go to church, you come into the church every year. Let's talk about it today. It's family. These are these are such key discussions that I'm I'm so glad we're finally having and we're finally having them candidly mm -hmm. in the open so that 
thank goodness for our internet because then people are able to learn because you know people don't have they don't have to come to us necessarily we can be we can go to them via this you know via beyonce's internet up here <laughs> you know because I, again it goes back to when i talk about when i talk about a lot of my girlfriends again my peers where we say man like when we start talking about like the things especially when it comes to consent and bodily autonomy the things that wish you back then that were like, man, we would have made such different decisions, mm -hmm. you know, like when people, and that's why, again, we see where folks end up having very traumatic experiences and then have strong aversion to things that would otherwise actually be pleasurable to them because yeah. somebody broke that trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? 100%. And, and, and also, and you, and you, you, I feel like you've touched on this heavily um, in context of man, the things that are missing in the academic, you know, programming in, and, and institutions, um, the the fact that, you know, the, the, the unique bubble that is college campuses or academic um, institutions, um, and especially like I, if you can quickly also touch on before we close the trends in context of maybe the hookup culture, like, I mean, do you see things changing, like from your perspective, obviously? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, so some of the things I've, is the way people communicate yeah. is that a lot of it is not face to face anymore. So you see mm -hmm. that a lot of it is over um, some kind of messaging, which yes. is which is great. Like I've been told, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> you're a creep if you ask for someone's phone number. Right. And so that <laughs> where it how you, ask it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just DM people like mm -hmm. phone numbers are for like your mom, your family, your girlfriend. Mm hmm. Phone num that's what phone numbers are for. DMs are for everybody. And so mm -hmm. it's just the way that they talk and interact has changed. And so mm -hmm. one of the um, studies that I use a lot when I do my work is the the CDC does a, a survey on youth, uh, assessing youth risk, right? And it's typically done for high school age people, which then become the college students. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is that fewer high school age students um, are sexually active or have ever had sex. So those numbers are mm -hmm. coming down. Right. The number of high school age students who've ever experienced sexual violence remains steady. And so you would think that there would be some kind of relationship that if fewer people are engaging in sex, that sexual violence has to happen less frequency frequently. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is that there's a gap in the education mm. so when they come to college. They continue to widen that gap. Um, most people who experience sexual violence do so by the age of 25. Correct. Right. And so those are hard numbers to hear and see. And so when they come to me, I I feel such a strong obligation to make sure that I give them as much information as I can, because I don't want them to be part of that statistic. Correct. Right. And and that's that's some of the, the, the trends and the things that we see is that they're choosing not to. And part of it is because there's increased sex education. So this whole idea yeah. that sex is going to make people have sex is not true. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know you're in STEM, but um, I learned geometry. Guess what? I don't do. I don't do that. There's nothing about <laughs> learning geometry that made me want to do it. I, I I did it, and I said no, thank you. That's <laughs> me. And so people who are having comprehensive yes. said are learning about it and going like, you know what? I don't. I'm choosing not to. And so we see that those violent, non-consensual behaviors are still occurring despite mm. the increased education. And so there's something else we're not doing. We're not yes. having the appropriate type of education. And then, you know, now I'm 18, now I'm 18, so I, I, I can do whatever I want, mm -hmm. you know? And so all of that privilege, that entitlement that you had been given, now you're doing it without any reins. Like, thank you. There's no, no context, there's no information, or rather there is also disinformation, yeah. right? Where the information that you're getting is actually not correct. Correct. Right. Where where you're getting misinformed about what mm -hmm. what is available to you, what's not available to you, mm -hmm. what puts you at risk, what does not put you at risk. Yeah. And so, yo, I am so glad we got to chop it up today. Um. Also, so you know, quickly as we wind down, man. Okay. Another quick plug for STEM and like learning. Um. Right. It goes back to how we teach consent mm -hmm. and how we make consent education practical and applicable applicable throughout the ages. Right. Like back to your yeah. your your note about you know learning geometry the things that you like especially in mathematics we'll, we'll keep it with mathematics you don't just come out and treat and teach calculus and differential equations to our third grader they'll be like what what makes no sense to me right no. 
incrementally. You got to start with your basic algebra, your one and one, your two plus two, plus and minuses, like the basics, right? And then as you get older, you get to your long division, you get to your, you know, complex brackets, and then yes. you get to you know, integration and derivatives, and then all the way to differential equations and, and onwards. Apply so, that to sex education, period. Like, literally, like, period. To me, that's how it's, I look at it. I'm like, it is. You know, don't just say, don't teach any mathematics, because that's just, it's going to make folks want to become scientists. We don't want that. You know? <laughs> we don't want that. It's crazy. No. Yeah. But yeah, I, I love, yeah, that was a good example. So thank you for playing that. <laughs> it's yeah. no problem. So as we wind down, I also do want to make sure I give you an opportunity because you're forever working on stuff. You'll be out here. I see you, sis. So I want to make sure that please, you know, plug if you have any stuff going on. If you yeah. have to connect with you, please do so. Take another minute or two. You're so sweet. Thanks. Yeah. So I, please feel free to follow me at Parabon Co. I mostly use Instagram. I, I have it filter into um, Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I do have something that I wanted to share with everybody. I am going to be um, launching like a subscription so it's called ticks in a box it does sound like dick in a box that's on purpose um and ticks is short for title nine but it's basically the consent program that i've been doing broken down into different modules you have a facilitator's guide you'll have learning outcomes assessments um you'll have workbooks activities and you'll also get a pre-taped pre-recorded um reading of me doing reading the consent chronicles which is this ridiculous book that winnie knows that i wrote um, and so if you would like to DM me and say, Winnie sent me with your email address. I will give you a coupon for 50% off a year subscription. Family. And I would also, which I didn't tell you this, ma'am, <laughs> I would like to give you a free year subscription so you can take the materials and do all your cool work, scale it up and down. And I would also like to gift you one to give to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> you so cute. I am so, I'm usually not speechless, but so it'll be launching in the next few weeks, so people will start to get access to it. I want people to have the education. I want to make it affordable, and I want it to be up to date, which is why I'm doing doing it this way. So. <laughs> Family. So. <laughs> Thank you. So You're welcome. Welcome. You're welcome. Like guys out, ladies, gentlemen, however you know you. You see, like at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Like we, we, again, I keep harping about availability does not equate accessibility, and we want to make sure we're we're bridging the gaps of lack of access to information and education and awareness. So again, you heard what Stacy said. If, you, if you're if you're picking up what we're putting down today, yeah, I need you to Winnie sent me. Drop me your email address. I'll send you a coupon. Right, and whether that you are a consent educator, whether you work as a as a consultant, whether you work in yep. an institution, or if you're an institution looking to get these resources, um, just follow up, it. reach yeah. out, okay? Yeah. Let them know we sent you out here. And <laughs> like, but I, you know what? I have nothing else to add to that. Sis has said it. She said what she said, and that's it. That's on Harriet. That's on Mary, and all of her little lambs. Okay. So <laughs> So with that, again, I thank each and every one of you yeah. out there for watching. I appreciate y'all and Stacey, I appreciate you. Thank and again, you. you know, stay connected with us at HARP. That's at www.harpnow.org. On social media platforms, that's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, at HARPnow.org, H-A-R-P-N-O-W-O-R-G. And again, at Stacey, it's at Peerbond Co. Peerbond, P-E-A-R-B-O-N-D-C-O. Can't miss it. Thank you, family. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>